Today we're going to jump into the math, um, and this is pretty. This is going to be most of the math for the unit, or the most important math for the unit. Uh, cal how to calculate uh, the energy associated with processes, whatever that might be, chemical reactions or physical changes. And the way we're going to do that, it's very difficult to put a thermometer into the system. But what is easy to do is put um, a thermometer into water and then have the reaction take place where the water gets to absorb or, re or release energy to the system. So we're going to indirectly measure um, what's going on with the system by actually measuring the surroundings. And we have an equation. It's in your equation sheet, so you don't have to memorize it. But it's right down here. Q, and Q is going to be energy, heat energy, equals M. M is the mass of uh, what's being, um, for us, uh, the water. C is going to be something called specific heat, and that's going to be specific to the material that we're interested in, usually water. And delta T is the change in temperature of that material, and usually it's going to be water. And if we do this type of uh, experiment, that's called calorimetry. Uh, we aren't going to get a chance to use, actually, I've never had a chance to use, I've never gone into um, uh, all the uh, thermo classes I took in college. We still didn't get to use a bomb calorimeter, uh, but if you were going to work for Heinz or Del Monte or some kind of uh, food company, you would probably get a chance to use uh, something called a bomb calorimeter. But our calorimeters are going to use that same process, but let's talk about what's going to happen here. So inside of, let's go with a, let's go with a, uh, a red here. Inside of this vessel, <clears throat> there will be a reaction that takes place. <clears throat> now, uh, maybe you have a little chunk of food right here, and you're trying to figure out how much energy um, the burning of that food would, um, would give off. So you'd have to obviously pump it in with some oxygen gas, otherwise the food won't burn. Uh, you're going to have to spark it. You know, give it some activation energy. So that's what that's for. And then uh, when this happens, energy will be released. So I'm just showing um, energy released here. And it's going to be released to its surroundings. Its surroundings is everything. It's uh, the wire that's going to spark the, uh, the reaction. It's going to be the, uh, the little tube that supplies the O2. It's going to be the metal sides. But what's going to be very important for us is this area here, or volume here, it's all water. And most of the energy will be absorbed by that water. Uh, yep, there's a thermometer in there, and that's going to absorb a little bit of energy. Yes, there's a, a stir in here so that... Uh, it's uniform throughout that, uh, but that's going to absorb a little bit of energy. And we can take an account for that. Uh, we're going to do that at the uh, conclusion of this unit here, this section. But anyhow, the water will absorb energy. The water is, this, is one of the surroundings, in this case the most important surrounding. And we can measure the temperature change that occurs with that water. And by doing that, we can use that equation that I mentioned... So we'll have a specific heat of water. By the way, the specific heat of water has those units and those numbers. Uh, the mass of the water, I don't know what that mass of water is, but that's going to be M. And then the change in temperature of that water, and I obviously don't know the change in temperature of that water. But if you multiply those three things together, uh, the mass, by the way, is going to have grams and then the temperature is going to be in Celsius and our units when we're said and done here the grams and grams cancel the Celsius and Celsius cancel 
and we're going to be left with joules. Oftentimes, this unit in joules, I'm sorry, this number with joules is going to be very, very high, very, very large. So lots of people will divide that by a thousand and get it into a kilojoules number. Uh, either of these are fine, but uh, some people don't like to write all those digits, so they just divide it by a thousand to make it a kilojoules. But this whole process, this calorimetry, uh, uses the first law of thermodynamics to, 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 to do this. So if you know how much energy the water absorbed, then you know how much energy the system lost or, or uh, vice versa. So I did mention uh, specific heat and I uh, also mentioned the units that go with specific heat, typically joules per uh, gram Celsius, or I, I guess I wrote it here as joules Celsius grams. Um, that's fine. Uh, joules per Celsius uh, times grams. Uh, we have our equation Q equals CM delta T. And I've mentioned this, but let's mention this again, that there's a system, there's a surroundings. So whatever the system is, is opposite of the surroundings. In this case, our surroundings are going to be this calorimeter with the water in it. So if we know what's going on with the water, the opposite sign is the system. So that's all I'm trying to show here is that one of these is going to be a positive, one of these is going to be a negative. One's going to be a negative, one's going to be a positive. So they're just uh, opposites. Later on, we're going to adapt this idea, and we're not quite ready to do that yet. Uh, we'll leave that for, um, for a little bit later here in this, uh, in this section. Uh, so, a little more detail about specific heats. The specific heat of water we're going to use a lot. And if you notice, the specific heat of water is tremendous compared to all these other items that are listed. Typically, metals, and I only have three metals on this list, metals have very low specific heats. Water, on the other hand, has a very, very high specific heat. So again, here's the units for um, for specific heat. And what does this really mean? So if you wanted to raise the temperature of water as opposed to raise the temperature of copper, you'd have to give water a tremendous amount of energy to raise the temperature of water. Uh, lead, copper, iron, on the other hand, let's, let's go with copper, doesn't take hardly any energy to change the temperature of copper. So that has its uh, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, you know, if you're going to, um, uh, well, instead of doing advantages and disadvantages, let's talk about two different scenarios here. We have a scenario where we have a, um, a skillet that has some water in it. The other skillet doesn't have anything in it. If you were going to set the burners, there's my, uh, there's my fire. Uh, if you were gonna set the burners up uh, and maybe wait 30 seconds, and you're not gonna do this, but if you put your hand in that water, it may not even feel warm yet. If you put your hand in this, at the bottom here, uh, you're gonna burn your hand. Uh, that's why you're not gonna do it. But that would maybe give you an example of uh, the differences between the high specific heat of water and the low specific heat of, uh, I should have maybe circled more iron for that. Uh, although there's some uh, skillets and pans and pots that have a copper uh, bottom to it, and the copper will even uh, it'll dis it, not dissipate. It'll transfer heat better, a little better than iron, and then it also has a little sp lower specific heat than iron. Also, okay. So let's maybe jump into the math here. Um, by the way, uh, before I guess before we get to that, we're going to use typically uh, those units, joules per gram Celsius. But 
you could use uh, Calvin instead. Um, it won't make a difference. Uh, also, instead of using grams, and we would call that uh, specific heat, uh, we could use um, another ID, molar, and all that changes is uh, grams to moles, that's all. So in case you ever see that in a textbook or a question. Okay, so let's jump in here. So we have our equation, and we're going to use this equation over and over and over again. Uh, we have water, so this is all about water. So we have the specific heat of water. I am probably not always going to write these units down because it, we're going to get programmed into knowing that specific heat is always joules per gram Celsius. Q, the answer Q, will always be in joules. The M will always be in mass, grams, and delta T will be in Celsius. Uh, the mass was 466 grams, and the change in temperature is final temperature minus initial temperature. So it went from 8.5 to 74.6. So we do that math, we're gonna get a gigantic number here. And that's with uh, sig figs. And lots of people don't like to look at that. So if you divide that by a thousand, you would get that into a kilojoules. And then we didn't talk about this yet. We would like to put words with this answer. So every, every one of these Q answers are either going to be the words released or absorbed. Well, it already says absorbed here. But let's talk about how we know it's absorbed. The temperature of the water increased. For the water to increase in temperature, energy had to be absorbed. Okay, this is a previous AP question. D, according to the graph, what's the temperature change? So final minus initial. Uh, the final temperature is somewhere. It's a little difficult to tell exactly, and so there's a little leeway allowed there, but this one's an exact. So I think it's around 32.4 degrees Celsius. You know, that would be 33 right there. Uh, and then the other one's definitely 20. When you do a subtraction, uh, the least amount of decimal places is what you need in your answer. So I think it's about 12.4 degrees Celsius when you subtract those two. Let me move that up just a little bit. We're not going to have a lot of tremendous amount of room here. Uh, calculate the magnitude. That means that they don't care about the words. They don't care about the signs. They just want the numeric value. But they do use words released. So, um, but anyhow, we're just going to need to use. I'm going to. I'm going to write it up into the graph here. Q equals C M delta T. Still the same equation. We're solving for Q. Um, assume that the specific heat of the reaction mixture. So instead of using that 4.18 for water, we have a new one given to us. So we better use that. Although primarily a solution is going to be water. I'm going to leave my units out, I think, for the rest of these questions. Uh, we were told how much of the mixture we have, so that's the mass. Typically this is water, but there's a little bit of solute in there. And then the change in temperature, we've already identified that that's 12.4. So multiply those together, and I get... Now how do I know joules? Because I had the joules in the specific heat. The other units, the grams and the Celsius, would cancel. And I know it said uh, that it wants the magnitude, but I would feel more comfortable if you guys also used 
words to go with our Q answer. By the way, it says the heat absorbed by the calorimeter is uh, not important. Okay, so um, let me go over here and add what we would normally have to do if that wasn't provided those, well, I'll give you an example of where we're going to have to use that. So uh, the typical math is CM delta T, but then if it gives you some information about how much heat is absorbed by the calorimeter, we're going to use that right here. And it's going to be, we can call it, uh, for lack of a better term, the energy associated with the calorimeter, how much energy is absorbed by the calorimeter. And occasionally, um, in the lab, we might identify what that number is or give you enough information we could solve for that. Uh, if nothing's provided to you, then we're assuming that um, the heat absorbed by all the other parts of the calorimeter aren't gonna be important. This was one of the harder questions you guys had in first year chem, and we'll tackle this here. So what makes this difficult is we have two sets of grams. We have three sets of Celsius uh, temperatures. So how are we going to actually figure out how to do a Q equals CM delta T for this? So first of all, what's the question? The question is, what's the specific heat of, of the alloy, of the metal? So if you were going to do a Q equals CM delta T, we're going to be hard pressed to, to be able to put that all together in one fell swoop. So what we're going to do is actually deal with everything about water first. So the Q of the water, how much energy is absorbed by the water? What's the specific heat of the water? What's the mass of the water? What's the change in temperature of the water? And the reason we're going to do this is because the first law of thermodynamics says if you know what's going on with the system, you know what's going on with the surroundings. If you know what's going on in the surroundings, you know what's going on in the system because energy is just going to be transferred between those two things. So the specific heat of water, 4.18. The mass of water, let's see. Oh, we're using 25 grams of water this time. And what's the change of uh, the temperature of the water? These are our two temperatures. Final temperature minus initial temperature. So what's going on in the water? And I'm not going to do anything with sig figs here because this isn't my answer yet. That's a joules. Oh, not released. The energy of the water, the temperature went up, so that means the energy was being absorbed by the water. Where did all that energy come from? It came from the alloy, the metal. Whoops, not allow, alloy. So the Q, the C, the M, the delta T, but this time, this energy that we just uh, calculated for H2O is also the energy for the alloy. The only difference is, is that one thing absorbs the energy, one thing releases the energy. So uh, negative 334.4 joules, energy released, negative, that's our Q for the alloy, is the specific heat of the alloy. I don't know that number, I'm trying to solve for that. Do we have a mass of the alloy? Yep, 15.5. Uh, do we have a change in temperature of the alloy? Well, we had a alloy that was initially at 98.9 degrees Celsius, and we threw that into the calorimeter. The calorimeter was 22.5 and it raised to 25.7 after you put the alloy in. So this temperature right here is not only for the water, it's also for the alloy. So the, the alloy 
um, was able to uh, eventually decrease in temperature to 25.7 and its initial temperature was 98.9 okay so we can solve for C and remember the units of C is going to be joules per gram Celsius I should have put that this uh, these are degrees Celsius whoops degrees Celsius here okay and then um, by the way, another item before we get too, too far is that if you can't keep your signs straight, which ones are negatives, which ones are positives, when you're all said and done here, you cannot have a negative specific heat. All specific heats are positive values. So when I do this math, rearrange this equation to solve for C, I get that number. And remember that I said that specific heats of metals are going to be very low numbers. Specific heat of water, on the other hand, is very, very, very large. Uh, you'll be hard-pressed to find specific heats larger than water. So 4.18 is going to be, a, in, our, in terms of specific heats, is a very large number. That is a, uh, that makes sense that the alloy is going to have a low specific heat. couple more questions here now we have a chemical reaction uh, HCl plus sodium hydroxide makes water and sodium chloride and you don't know this yet but you're gonna realize this now is that when you have a neutralization reaction it's also going to generate energy Okay, so energy is going to be on the product side. It's going to be exothermic. How do I know that? Well, our initial temperature was 19.5, and it's going to raise to 21.21. So let's calculate the heat. The heat is Q equals Cm delta T. Um, it's not told to us what the specific heat of the mixture is. So we're going to assume, unless told you otherwise, that the specific heat is water's specific heat, because this is almost all water. It's also not told to you what the mass is, but with water, one gram equals one milliliter, unless it's told to you otherwise. So if we know the milliliters, so by the way, 50 milliliters plus 50 milliliters when you add those together, you would get 100 milliliters, or for us, 100 grams. And then the change in temperature, our final temperature was 21.21, and our initial temperature was 19.5. So work on that math there. So 715 joules are released by that system when you multiply those, the CM delta T. So that's the heat of the reaction. And then the second part here, molar heat of neutralization. So to do that, you have to take your Q and divide it by the moles of limiting reactant. Okay, well, how do we get moles? Well, we have a volume and a molarity and a volume and a molarity. Now, if you look, they're identical volumes and molarities. <clears throat> so they're both going to be the limiter reactant. They're both going to run out at the same time because it's a one-to-one -one ratio between those two terms. So 0.25 moles per liter or a thousand milliliters times 50 milliliters will give us our moles so this is a way to incorporate 
the stoichiometry, the uh, factor label with now thermochemistry. So to provide us with molar heat of neutralization, we have to take our Q and divide it by our moles. But, this is a very big but here. Uh, why? I don't know. Uh, well, I do know why, but you don't know why yet. But with Q, we often use words to describe the numeric value. But with molar heat of neutralization of any molar heat, uh, people generally don't use the words anymore. They use uh, signs. So released means negative. So negative 715 joules divided by our moles of aluminum reactant will give us our uh, it's going to give you a gigantic number actually too big for most people so if you divide that by a thousand you would get uh, a nicer looking number negative 226 kilojoules per mole. If you don't want to do that, that's fine. Negative 226000 joules per mole. So that is the molar heat of neutralization for that particular reaction. And our last question, it's gonna look like two questions, but uh, it's a two-parter. We have a chemical we're gonna burn. Any hydrocarbon has potential to burn. Uh, you could write this out in a chemical reaction, but I don't think uh, anywhere in this question is going to require us to do that. If we did, we would have to write out the balanced chemical equation. There is a mass of the naphthalene. There's a mass of water. There's a change in temperature of water. Assuming that no heat is lost outside the calorimeter, calculate the heat gained by the calorimeter. Heat is Q. So this all deals with everything inside the calorimeter. We have the specific heat of the calorimeter. Well, what's in the side of the calorimeter is water. So we're going to use that. The mass of water. So it looks like we're completely disregarding this uh, burning material here. Uh, that's not going to be the case when we get to the next slide. And then the temperature of the water. So the final temperature of the water minus the initial temperature of the water. So do that math and we're going to get large number, 2,370 joules absorbed by the calorimeter. That also means, by the way, that 2,370 joules are released by the combustion reaction. We're going to end up using that, I think, um, shortly here. Okay, so the exact same information is provided. This is kind of just part two of the question. If the calorimeter constant was determined to be 29.0 joules per degree Celsius, we haven't talked about how you come up with that. We'll actually talk about that when we uh, perform a lab. So that'll be for our, our lab day. Calculate the heat of combustion of naphthalene. So that's a Q. And then we're also going to um, put that per mole. So we've done a little bit of that already, that per mole idea. But let's conquer this part first. So the Q that we talked about in the previous slide was... 
2,370 joules. But now we're going to assume that the, um, the calorimeter itself, the whatever the surroundings that we didn't put the thermometer into, uh, everything but the water, also absorbs some energy. And how much energy does it absorb? It absorbs 21, sorry, 29.1 joules per every degree Celsius. Um, and how much degree Celsius did this, did this material change? It went from 25.95 down to 20.28. So if we assume that the calorimeter doesn't absorb any extra energy, it's the answer 23.70 joules. But now we have this additional information provided to us so we can do this extra um, idea. So the calorimeter itself also absorbs some energy that we didn't take into account for because the thermometer wasn't able to take that into account for us. So when we do that, uh, we're going to get so this 29.1 joules per degree Celsius times this uh, subtraction of 25.95 minus 20.28 is going to give us uh let's see i did the, i'm doing the math right now let me rewrite that so it looks a little nicer two thousand five hundred and thirty five joules when you add all that up. So a total of 2535 joules released by the combustion reaction. So if we wanted now to get the heat released per mole, that means we'd have to know how many moles of naphthalene we have. Well, we know how many grams of naphthalene we have. So let's do a little conversion there. So go to the periodic table, find 10 carbon masses, uh, add eight hydrogen masses. That is 128 grams per mole. So if we take that 2535 and divide that by 0 0.01121 moles, we'll get a gigantic number. And remember that we use those words for Q. When we get per mole, um, we typically don't like to use those signs, I'm sorry, those words, but in this question, it does say heat, heat released. So we'll stick with that. And then if you divide that by a thousand, you might, whoops, you might get a number that you might prefer. And lots of people would agree that they would rather see that in kilojoules. So 226 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so that concludes today. Definitely practice Q equals CM delta T.